just with that compost making, do you have any tangible way of measuring whether you make a humified compost as opposed to this is the big thing <coughs> at the moment that we're encouraged by our cousins from America to make uh, humified compost. Okay, so the question was about humified compost and are there any ways of measuring. I, I don't have anything to do with making compost or know very little about making compost. My, I'm a grassland ecologist and the work I do is in perennial grasslands and in growing crops in perennial grasslands and that sort of thing. So I can't really answer that question. All I can tell you is that from scientific research, if you add humic compounds to soil, they have a protective effect on very simple carbon compounds that come out of plant roots and there, it would be a benefit to have a humified compost. Now, whether when people say it's humified, it is, I don't know. And whether an American technique is going to be any better than an Australian technique, I really couldn't answer that, except to say that I think all of that technology is going to be very, very important to the future of agriculture, and it's obviously a, a new area that we need to know a lot more about. And I don't know very much about it other than that, but humic compounds are very, very important. Yeah. What was just the very first part of that question? I heard the end of it. Yeah. But don't forget, we're going, to build, we're going to build carbon that will be stable for hundreds of years. Yeah, so would it be an annual payment or would it be a one-off payment? Okay, would it be an annual payment or, or a one-off payment? Okay. And just another one. You had one... Oh, sorry. <laughs> just at the back there. And then... Um, humus is um, relatively stable to microbial decomposition. Labile carbon will give off lots of greenhouse gases, but humus tends to not be broken down. Yep. Uh, the figures you gave before for the amount of grasslands we need to sequester the Australian... Yeah, the 0.5% or 2%. Is yep. there room for us to sequester uh, emissions from other countries and make money? Yes. We, we have enough land in Australia to be able to sequester global emissions if we put our minds to it, which I think is pretty exciting. But we need to make Australia carbon neutral first. <laughs> and, then, and I think we need to show the world how that can be done. And we, we have huge potential to do that because of the fact that we have a large area relative to our population and relative to our industrial activity and relative to our, our emissions, as I said. I mean, you'd have to wonder, really, I suppose, and that, this is what a lot of big business people have been saying, why are we going to put business through so much pain when we only contribute 1.13 to global emissions anyway? What difference can we, can we make? But I mean, often that's an argument that's put up for not doing anything. Um, obviously, we do need to do things and we are polluting too much. But it'd be nice to think that we could be carbon neutral and to know that we were, to have the figures to prove that we were. Um, I think it would be good for Australia's image and then to show the world that, yes, we could... And other countries could sequester their own emissions in their soils too. So globally we, we do have an answer if we were to go down that track. Make you wonder why people didn't want to or for some reason try to discredit it. Okay, so um, I have lots and lots of questions here. How hot's that? Um, the question about, I guess it just relates to that one that came up there. Were we looking at perennial annual savannas? Um, legumes, revegetation work, what sort of carbon pools, grazing systems, the effect of dead grass, um, and the payment sort of system. So just to to try and answer those in a in a general overview, um, the annual the areas of Australia that are currently covering currently carrying either annual pastures or annual crops, in other words, the southern half of Australia, that's our biggest potential initially or increasing soil carbon because there's been huge reductions there. If you look at the amount of carbon in farmed areas compared to the amount of carbon under pasture, it's, it's roughly half, just about, doesn't matter which state you're looking in or what percentage you started with. So if you started with six, it's three. If you started with one, it's, it's half. In other words, if there's 
6% under pasture, there might be 3% under farmed areas. And in some areas of Victoria, that's, that's the case because they have good soils and reliable rainfall. In other areas, um, there might only be one under pasture, but there'll be half or 0.3 or 0.2 or something in farmed soil. So it seems to be that the relativities seem to, to stay, stay reasonably constant. In other words, you could almost guarantee that if you could take a farmed soil back to how it was when it was a pasture soil, you could, you could double the amount of carbon in the soil. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm not really too sure what the situation... Who asked the question about the tropical savannas? And, um, yeah, I mean, the reason that we're looking at, at farmed soils is because it's, they're, they're easy to categorise and also we need to have to be able to say that's a form of land management that's happening there at the moment and we can define what those areas are and what's happening in them because the areas that will be designated as carbon sequestration areas will all be mapped and we'll be following them over time to see what happens to them. So if they're being currently used for farming and they continue to use them for farming and they're farming now into perennial grasses rather than, than having bare soil, it's, it's the easiest option for us to, to follow. If you start looking at tropical savannas, um, you'd be looking under grazing systems, you'd be looking under some areas that would be burned to some that wouldn't, a whole range of different sort of management systems, whereas farming tends to, to be a fairly straightforward sort of a, of a technique. Um, no, that's not going to stop us from doing it. What, with the carbon neutral strategy, what we want to do is identify areas that we can go in and change relatively easily and achieve carbon neutral status for Australia. But we'd, I'd like to think that we could find ways of increasing carbon in all of our situations and under, um, under all of our enterprises and enterprise mixes. And, and also given that they're going to be different every year too. I mean, people are always going to be, want to be flexible and not have to stick with any one sort of a system. I suppose that's one of the things about if you designate, if you go in for carbon sink forestry, you have to um, maintain the trees on that one parcel of land for 100 years, which means that basically that land can't be used for anything else. If, if in 50 years' time we find that the world's population is starving and every square metre is, is you know, vital for food production, then what happens to all of our carbon sink forests if we are either faced with people starving or, you know, are we going to have trees or produce food? So I think that food story is a very strong one, global food security, um, very important to turn to, um, to have soil as a, as a carbon sink and be able to continue to produce that food.